You're strapped in your seat in the vast open space with Earth behind you getting smaller and smaller. All around you are toggles and controls to keep the spacecraft intact. You and two other crew members are working hard at those controls. Out the window, you see some meteorites flying by and stars and planets out in the distance. You're about to be one of the first people to land on the moon after years of research and testing. You have to consider all the steps perfectly. Otherwise, you could face many complications, like crashing into a flying asteroid, or even being left in the vacuum of space without any way of getting on track. Research shows that around one-third of all moon landings faced many problems. Launching towards the moon requires a special rocket traveling at more than 25,000 miles per hour. And once in lunar orbit, the spacecraft can detach itself from the rocket and navigate its way to the surface of the moon and land. Sounds simple, right? Well, figuring out the math to land was the reason landing a human on the moon used to seem like a ridiculous idea. But scientists were able to pull it off by studying and observing the flight of helicopters. Unlike an airplane that needs velocity to take off, the large propellers on a helicopter give it a good push to fly around. It basically has to twirl with enough force to lift its own weight from the ground. With that in mind, we need to consider the gravitational force pulling everything down. On Earth, the force of gravity is 32 feet per second squared. On the Moon, it's only 5 feet per second squared. So we got landing on Earth figured out for the most part. But what about landing on a surface that barely assists you in that? There had to be three steps, doing all the research and math needed for calculating the proper conditions, using a test vehicle to practice in, and using a flight simulator to imitate the conditions of the Moon's atmosphere. Choppers weren't really good references for landing since gravity is doing most of the work, and the spacecraft looks nothing like a helicopter. They needed to simulate a spaceship of only 5 6 the weight of it. Since the gravitational pull on the Moon is weaker than on Earth, navigating it under these conditions is vital for when the real thing comes. The scientists of NASA decided to get a crane hangar to lift the spacecraft with cables while simulating the flight and landing. Kind of like stunt actors in a movie with cables attached to them for action fight scenes. But it still wasn't enough to determine if you could actually land properly on the moon without the safety cables to help you. They needed proper freedom. So it was back to the drawing board. They were about to throw in the towel until they came up with a brilliant idea to simulate the landing conditions on the moon by installing a sort of detachable jet fan into the bottom of the spacecraft to keep consistent thrust upwards. By doing this, they were able to create a scenario where the craft would be 5 6 of its weight on Earth and without the safety cables to hold it. But after many trials and errors, the only way to see if landing on the moon was possible was by actually doing it. So, being so far away from Earth, you and your team see the moon out your window. It's a lot bigger than it looks from Earth. Its surface fills up the entire window. But landing won't be a piece of cake. The spaceship has to orbit around the moon to determine the best time to land. And don't worry, that's why you have a team for that. It can take more than 24 hours to know when and where the perfect place to land is after performing various tests and measurements. And once you get the best calculations, the actual spaceship detaches from the orbiting one and makes its way downwards. This is where the helicopter physics come into play. A helicopter needs to tilt at least 5 degrees to move forward after ascending from the ground. Same for going backwards. But that's because we have gravity to assist it. Up above the moon, soaring through the vacuum of space, the ship would need to tilt at least 30 to 40 degrees to move forward. As soon as the ship reached a nice spot for landing, it would go back to 90 degrees and slowly land on the surface. As you get closer, you can see the moon's surface just a few feet away. This is the tricky part, but it's a success. The team back on Earth couldn't be happier. The crew members are also thrilled about what you've achieved. You put on your spacesuit and gear and climb down the ladder. 
You leave your first footprint on the moon and look out at the distance ahead of you. The Earth is just a little blue dot far away. You're able to bounce around in the near-zero gravity. Now, that's what I call moonwalking. After spending much time on the moon, it's time to head back. Neil Armstrong, the first man to step on the moon, spent only about two and a half hours on its surface before returning. But, oh no, you forgot the keys inside the ship and now you're stranded. Nah, just kidding. Although it would have made a good plot twist. You get back and launch the spacecraft back into orbit to reunite with the other ship above you. And once you've reattached, you exit the moon's orbit and head back to Earth. By sending humans to the moon consistently, the next big step can be achieved by landing on Mars. The famous exploration rover Curiosity traveled around the surface of Mars and gathered information needed for humans to land there. And NASA is aiming to have the first humans up there after 2030. The journey will be hundreds of times harder than the one towards the moon. But many scientific questions will be answered once it happens. Humans may be able to gather some of the natural resources there and even build outposts and colonies. There are endless possibilities as well as challenges. The journey from the Earth to the Moon is around 250,000 miles. Mars is around 35 million miles away. There could be a possibility of a new human outpost stationed on Mars. Building a new society of scientists and engineers to make the most out of the conditions. It would be completely self-sufficient, providing proper ways for farming and agriculture. And by having humans on Mars for so long, scientists can properly understand the planet. But to understand how the human body responds to deep space environment, we'd have to have a lot of practice before getting that ticket to Mars. The closest experience of having a colony in the middle of nowhere is the Amazon Scott Station on the South Pole. It's designed to withstand all the harsh conditions of the freezing dry cold. Being at the bottom of the world can be pretty stressful without proper practice. The journey may not be as far as Mars or the Moon. But being on the South Pole is like arriving on a whole new planet. The station itself is equipped to provide the proper conditions everyone needs to be comfortable. Besides the strong heating system, the station has a recreational room for sports and music a library, a lounge, and even a greenhouse to grow all the right veggies and fruits. In fact, the greenhouse is the only way you'd get to feel like you're in a rainforest. And even before applying there, you'd have to get screened to see if you can handle the isolation for months. Not that you'd be completely alone, but still away from civilization. Antarctica's whole population consists of scientists and engineers. And you need to be examined by a doctor to determine if you're physically fit to stay there. The station is built there for scientists to study space and things related to geology. Being in the biggest desert in the world can take its toll on you. When leaving the station, you have to wear at least three layers of gloves and extremely thick sweaters and jackets to withstand the cold. They even compared stepping on the South Pole to walking on the moon. The Moon, a beautiful, natural satellite with some mysterious dark splotches. We always see only one side of it, so we're used to this image. It's hard to imagine the Moon looking any other way. But it used to be different. Oh ho ho, it used to be so different. Picture this, a huge incandescent satellite in the sky that is causing constant tsunamis. I suggest we go very far into the past to see what the Moon was like many, many years ago. The Moon formed around 4.5 billion years ago. At that time, our green-blue planet was still a red-hot, insanely unstable piece of rock flying in space. We didn't have the Moon yet, and a day on our planet only lasted 6 hours, which meant only 3 hours of daylight. Volcanoes erupted all over the place, releasing poisonous gas into the air, and a bunch of meteorites regularly crashed into the planet. At the same time, 4.5 billion years ago, the so-called Big Splash occurred, or as scientists call it, the Giant Impact Hypothesis. It claims that once an object the size of Mars crashed into Earth, 
Mars is about two times as small as our planet, so the blow wasn't too bad, but it was quite catastrophic. This powerful impact tore off part of the outer layers of that Mars-sized object and Earth. The very core of this space body merged with Earth's own dense core, and a huge number of fragments of Earth flew into outer space. So, this was the beginning of our moon, or, saying in a scientific way, the process of differentiation has begun. This is the process all planetary bodies go through at the beginning of their lives. Since the impact was very hot, its heat carried away most of the gases and liquids from the broken pieces of Earth. Only a relatively dry stone surface remained. So yeah, there is water and gases on the moon, but in very small quantities. The gravity of our planet was strong enough to make all these hot stone fragments stay in its orbit, and they gradually began to stick together. The chemicals they contained were distributed in layers. Iron, which was heavier, sank deeper inside, and lighter elements formed the surface. In a short time, a hundred years or less, the ring of steam, dust, and molten rock fused together. The largest clusters with the strongest gravity attracted more and more particles, gradually forming the moon. It looked like a red-hot bubble ball. Sadly, the nucleus of this newborn moon turned out to be very small. It lacked iron and other heavy elements to form into something substantial, like a planet. The oldest rocks of the moon probably formed in the ocean of magma. And when the moon gradually cooled down, it turned out to be a white, clean, and perfectly even ball. But it was still completely different from what we have now. To begin with, immediately after its birth, the satellite was located at a distance of only 13,500 miles away from Earth. This is 15 times closer than it is now, around 238,000 miles. It's scary to imagine how huge and bright the moon looked in the sky at that moment. The view was probably both beautiful and terrifying. And, of course, such proximity caused incredibly huge waves on Earth. The planet experienced regular tsunamis. Also, at that time, the moon was spinning very fast, and it wasn't turned to Earth with only one side. But, in general, Earth and the Moon had a positive impact on each other. For example, it was the Moon that made our day last 24 hours. Now, Earth's axis is mostly tilted 23.5 degrees from the plane of its orbit around the Sun. Without the Moon, Earth rotated rapidly. But thanks to the satellite, the planet's tilt stabilized, which led to a wide and pleasant variety of climates on Earth. To be fair, the gravity of our planet also helped the Moon. Thanks to it, the moon began to rotate more and more slowly while gradually moving away from us. Over the years, its orbit has moved far away from our planet. At the same time, the moon became tidally locked to Earth. This means that its rotation period coincides with its orbital period. Or, in other words, the moon moves around itself as fast as it moves around the Earth. That's why the moon always faces our planet with only one side. When the moon moved away, tides on Earth became calmer. Now, water could flow to the most remote corners of our planet. It was then that life appeared on Earth. But back to the evolution of the moon itself. What was happening on its surface after its formation? The next stages of the moon's development were childhood and adolescence. And as is usually the case at this stage, this period was insane. No wonder! About 4 billion years ago, the solar system was going crazy. During the first 600 million years of the Moon's existence, large asteroids and comets constantly collided with it. Now, they were bothering not only our Earth, but also its satellite. These impacts were the most powerful in the history of the Moon. They left many large craters, which were later filled with dark rock. So, Earth wasn't enough for you, huh, space? Once, a dwarf planet crashed into the moon. It was about the size of Ceres, the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This explosion formed the SPA basin and also forever changed the appearance of the moon. Can you see that dark spot on the far side of the moon? Right there in this very south? This spot is called the South Pole-Aitken Basin. Its diameter is about 1,600 miles 
And yes, it was formed by the impact I've mentioned about 4.3 billion years ago. This planet brought with it a bunch of complex and strange chemical compounds that scientists are now finding all over the far surface of the moon. These compounds began to emit a lot of heat, melted part of the lunar mantle, and, oops, accidentally woke up volcanoes. The volcanoes began to erupt furiously. A huge amount of magma was distributed over the surface of the moon. Many years later, it cooled down, leaving behind those famous dark splotches that we're so used to. They're called the Lunar Maria. There are much fewer craters there than on the lunar highlands. But for the last billion years, the moon has been geologically inactive, except for occasional collisions with meteorites. In general, the appearance of the moon changed forever as a result of these events, and, battered and tired, it entered adulthood. But even then, it couldn't get any peace. A bunch of meteorites decided to bother it again. Honestly, it wasn't that bad. There were many collisions, but all of them were quite small. They just left a bunch of craters and pits on the moon and maybe damaged its mantle a little. Some of the collisions deepened already existing large craters. The moon's crust was getting thinner and thinner over the years because of all the chaos going on. And now we call this upper part of the lunar crust covered with craters the lunar highlands. All those white and bright areas of the moon? The highlands. But in the end, the universe finally calmed down for now at least, and the moon began to look the way it does today. There are still many things we don't know about Earth's natural satellite. There are moments in its history that scientists still can't accurately explain, but they're continuing to study our beautiful satellite. The data about the moon is useful to people not only for its own sake, it gives us a more complete picture of both the history of our solar system and space as a whole. So, let's hope that one day, we'll be able to find out everything there is to know about the Moon. Have you ever seen the other side of the Moon? Ah, I caught you. Of course not. But maybe you've seen it in photos. In that case, have you ever wondered why the two sides look so different? Well, let me tell you. We can't see the other side of the Moon. People believe this is because the Moon doesn't rotate around its axis. But this is not true. The Moon does rotate. It just does it at the same rate as its orbital motion. This is a particular case of tidal locking called synchronous rotation. The first time we ever saw a far side was only in 1959, all thanks to the Soviet Luna missions and later the US Apollo program. Now, when Luna 3 and other spacecraft transmitted the first far side images, they revealed a far more cratered hemisphere that looked more like Mercury or Jupiter's moon Callisto, it looked completely different from what we were used to. And that's when we learned how meh the other side is. No, seriously, just look at it. The near side can boast its thinner and smoother crust. These beautiful dark splotches are called lunar mare, the last remnants of ancient lava flows. And when I say ancient, I mean it. They're more than 3 billion years old. Meanwhile, the far side crust is thicker and crater pocked. The lava flows had almost no effect on these impact craters. It's also devoid of any large-scale mare. Low-key looks like dried white cheese. To be honest, don't you agree that the nearby side is much more beautiful? Write your thoughts in the comments. So, only 50 years ago, we learned something about the apparent differences. But then the scientists discovered something weird. Both sides are different, even in the geochemical composition. And not only in this, our side was thinner than the far side by several miles. But where did such significant differences come from on an ordinary floating stone ball? For scientists, this was a mystery. They started coming up with a lot of theories. The melted moon theory was the main one for a while. It said that it was the Earth's fault that our moon looks like this. This happened several billion years ago. The moon was born because of a collision. One day, an object about the size of Mars crashed into the Earth. At that moment, a piece broke off from it, which later became the Moon. However, this piece was somewhere 15 times closer to Earth than it is now. Some scientists created pictures of the so-called early Moon. Unlike our cute little white ball, the early Moon was a strange-looking boiling scarlet ball. 
that piece didn't leave us after the separation. It became tidally locked very soon after. The Earth after the collision was still an incandescent nightmare, full of fire and lava. It was boiling at a temperature of 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And since the Moon has always been turned toward us with one side, this side has melted down a little. This would explain why the Moon's surface, the so-called mantle, is thinner on the near side than on the far side. During the boiling of the Earth, certain elements evaporated from it. They then settled on the Moon. This would explain the difference in geochemical composition between the two sides. But there was a plot hole in this theory. If that's what happened, then where did rare foreign chemical elements come from, such as unusual isotopes of phosphorus, potassium, or tungsten? The nearby site is full of them, and they couldn't have come from the Earth. There were also other theories. Another one said that initially, we had two teeny tiny moons. Later, they merged into a big one, hence the difference in their composition. But this theory sounds a bit crazy, and it has a plot hole too. For example, the transition between the two sides is way too soft. If our moon was actually two tiny moons, this transition would be more abrupt. So scientists were kind of at a loss on this one. But recently, they finally figured out what really happened to the moon, all thanks to NASA's GRAIL orbiters. They spent over a year whizzing around the moon, mapping it out, and studying its composition. Using this data, scientists have created around 360 computer simulations. They contain different impacting objects of many sizes, traveling at different speeds. Scientists were comparing the results with our current moon. They tried to determine which result was the closest to what we have today. And so, they finally solved this 50-year-old mystery. The answer lies in a collision with a dwarf planet. This collision occurred 4.3 billion years ago. This huge object was slightly larger than Ceres. For those who don't know, Ceres is one of the dwarf planets of our solar system. Its diameter is 580 miles. You could say that one France or one Germany would fit into it. So this giant object crashed into the moon, somewhere near the South Pole. This collision was so strong that it changed the image of the moon forever. It left a trail of 3,500 miles behind. It would take you 14 hours by plane to fly that distance. This crater covered the entire near side of the moon. It caused damage to the moon's mantle. It also created a so-called South Pole Aiken Base, or SPA Basin. This is an impact crater and has a diameter of 1,600 miles, which is like adding one UK plus one Germany. It's important, though. The formation of this basin was a defining event in the history of the Moon. And it's the second largest impact crater in the solar system. The collision also caused a powerful hot wave to spread across the Moon. This wave scattered over the remnants of those rare, warm minerals scientists found on the nearby side. That's how our beautiful side became home to something called Procellarum creep terrain or PKT for short. This is basically a compositional anomaly, a concentration of potassium, phosphorus, and other rare elements like thorium. You can say that those minerals are a gift to us from deep space. Anyway, there were many, and I mean many, collisions in the Moon's history. All of them only deepened this already large crater. That's why the mantle on the near side was getting thinner and thinner with the years. Also, our gifted minerals gave off a lot of heat, so the mantle has melted a little bit more and more. Oops, this accidentally caused the moon's volcanoes to wake up. Volcanic activity has increased on the near side. Intense lava flows filled the old empty craters. Ta-da! And this is how the beautiful lunar mare was born. And uh, that's about how it all happened. All this information was found thanks to the researchers from Brown, Purdue, Stanford Universities, and NASA's JPL. The research was published by the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets. So you can read about it in more detail if you're interested. There are still many things we need to learn about the Moon. The highest priority is the return mission from the South Pole, the Aitken Basin. Samples brought from there will be used to determine the age of the Moon, its history, and the nature of the crust and mantle more accurately. Another critical target is the Moskovians. 
This is the name of a large lava plain on the far side of the moon. Studying it will help us better understand the difference between the two sides, as well as tell us how the other side was formed. All this knowledge is significant for understanding the history of the moon, but it's also handy for space exploration in general. Scientists use the moon as a reference point to determine the age of other planets and entire worlds in space. The moon helps us determine the chronology of the life of the whole solar system. So stay tuned for new exciting research and discoveries.